Hey Chem Kids, Campbell here. I am so excited about today's video. Today we're going to start an adventure on the journey into the language of chemistry. So we're going to start by talking about ionic nomenclature. Now I know you're like, wait Mrs. Campbell, what other type of nomenclature are we going to learn? Well, there are different categories of compounds. Today we're going to talk about the language of ionic compounds. Then there are molecular compounds and acids, but we'll learn about those in other units. So I guess I should first start by saying what an ionic compound is, right? Well, an ionic compound is when I have a metal, which on the periodic table are the guys on the left. So all these blue guys here, those are metals. When they're bound to a non-metal, these little brown guys on the right side of the periodic table, well, and then there's hydrogen, but we'll deal with hydrogen and acids. So anytime we have a metal bound to a nonmetal, we follow the rules for ionic nomenclature. So what are the rules? Well, first of all, we have to talk about the types of ionic compounds. So there are two different types of ionic compounds, and their difference is in how many elements they have. A binary compound is a compound that only has two elements in it, like this one, which has sodium and chlorine, and we call it sodium chloride. Or there are what are called ternary compounds. Ternary compounds have three or more elements. One way you can tell them is they always have one of those wonderful polyatomic ions in them that you're all remembering, right? All right, let's go through the rules for binary first. So for a binary compound, it's pretty simple. All we do is name that first element, which is our metal, first. So here we have sodium. And then we name the second element, which is our nonmetal, second. But we change its ending, so instead of being chlorine, we change the ending to IDE. So it becomes chloride. So we have sodium chloride. Let's take a look at it, a couple examples. Here is the element potassium with the element sulfur. So name the first one first, potassium, and name the second one, but change the ending to IDE. So we get potassium sulfide. Don't worry about the numbers. Here's another one. Name the first element first, that's magnesium. Name the second element and change its ending to IDE. So this is magnesium fluoride. What about this one? Well, first element here is aluminum. Second element is oxygen. Change the ending so we get aluminum oxide. All right, I'm going to give you two. I want you to pause the video and see if you can come up with the names for these guys. Well, did you get beryllium sulfide and lithium nitride? Gosh, I hope so. Make sure you're learning all your element names. Let's take a look at ternary compounds. In ternary compounds, we have a metal, you know, the stuff on the left side of the periodic table, bound to a polyatomic ion, like this one right here, right? This is the element sodium, and this is the polyatomic ion chlorate. So our rules are very similar, except we don't have to worry about endings now. Rule number one, name the first element first, so sodium. Name the polyatomic ion second, this is chlorate. So this is sodium chlorate. Not bad, huh? All right, let's take a look at some examples. Here I have calcium bound to phosphate, so it's just calcium phosphate. And here I have sodium bound to the hydroxide polyatomic ion, so we call it sodium hydroxide. And we have our two polyatomic ions now. Whoa, that first polyatomic ion is ammonium. And our second polyatomic ion here is carbonate. So this is ammonium carbonate. All right, I've got two more for you. Pause the video and see if you can figure out the names of these guys. If you said the first one is barium sulfite, you are correct. And the second one is lithium sulfate. Remember with polyatomic ions, the one with the less oxygens is the ite. All right, now, you're probably wondering, how do I go the other way? How do I take a name and write a formula? Well, for that, we need to go to the whiteboard. So, come on, let's go! So before we actually start writing chemical formulas, let's talk a little bit more about them. 
Remember when we were naming them, I said to ignore the little numbers, those little subscripts that were by the elements. But those things are important when we're writing chemical formulas because they tell us how much of each element is in the chemical formula. So to figure that out, first we've got to go back to talking about charges. Remember in the charge video I said some atoms will lose electrons, some gain electrons. And there's actually a pattern to that. So I need you to get out your periodic table because I'm going to have you write on it. All right, so do you have your periodic table? A periodic table is arranged in rows and columns, and actually the columns have some significance in terms of charge. So everything in that very first column, which we actually call group one, like hydrogen and lithium and sodium, they all lose one electron and gain a charge of positive one. Anything in the second column, or group two, where we have our barium and magnesium and calcium, all of those guys will lose two electrons and get a charge of plus two. Now, these guys in the middle here, they get different charges. They could be plus two, plus three, plus one. So we're going to actually think about them in our next unit. So let's keep going and we get over here to group three. Group three um, has aluminum in it here and these guys will lose three electrons and gain a charge of plus three. Now we're going to skip carbon and move over to these other nonmetals and we get to the column that has nitrogen and phosphorus in it and this group actually gains three electrons and gets a charge of negative three. Over here with oxygen and sulfur, we gain two electrons and we get a charge of negative two. And this column here, which is actually group seven, which has fluorine and chlorine and bromine and iodine in it, they all will gain one electron and get a charge of minus one. So the ones that I've boxed here are the ones that you'll have to worry about uh, from an element naming standpoint in ionic nomenclature. So when atoms form compounds, what they do is they stick together until their charges equal zero, and then they're not sticky anymore. So let's take a look at an example. In our first group, right, we have sodium, which is plus one. So these little Pac-Man looking things are my sodium. They have a docking station for one negatively charged particle. So I have my little sodium guys in a little solution with some chloride ions. Chloride will form a charge of negative one. Now, right now they're sticky. So what they do is they find each other and they'll stick to each other until their total charge equals zero. So plus one minus one equals zero. Plus one minus one equals zero. Oh, this poor sodium. He has no one to get with. Now, what about if we go to stuff in group two? Like our calcium. Calcium has a charge of plus two. So that means it has like two docking stations. So if we put it in with a beaker of chlorine, what's going to happen is our minus one chlorine is going to stick to the calcium and it becomes unsticky when I have two chlorine and one calcium because calcium's plus two and then to that I add a negative one and another negative one right and that equals zero okay so let's start writing chemical formulas my first one up here I have sodium chloride we've done sodium chloride a lot we even did it with our little Pac-Man puzzle pieces so first thing I want you to do is make sure you have your periodic table so you can find the charges on each of the elements and then let's write them so I have sodium, the symbol for sodium is Na, and on the periodic table it's in group one, so sodium is plus one. And here's chloride, which is the chlorine atom, and so I find chlorine, and that's in group seven there, which has a charge of minus one. The symbol for chlorine is Cl, and the charge is minus one. So when I put them together, I need to make sure I have a the number of elements of each of these that adds up to zero. So plus one minus one equals zero. So I'm good and I can just write them as NaCl. So I only need one of each so that I get a charge of zero. Now, how do you know that the sodium goes first? I mean, is it because the in my name the sodium's first? Well, anytime we are writing chemical formulas the metal ion or the positive ion is the one that always goes first. So that's really why it's first. But that's the way we name it also. All right, let's take a look at sodium nitride. Sodium, again, we know is Na. 
and it's plus one. Nitride come, is nitrogen. So nitrogen symbol is an N, and it's here in group five, which has a minus three. Yikes, one minus three is not zero. So what do I need to do to make them equal zero? Well, what I need to do is I need three of these, right? Because three times plus one would be plus three, plus three minus three equals zero. So when I write this formula, I'm going to write Na, oops, Na3N. So I need three sodiums and one nitrogen. Now when we write the number of atoms that we have, we need to write that as a subscript. All right, you try one. You try calcium chloride and try magnesium bromide. All right, well, calcium is in group two, right? So it's a plus two on the periodic table, and chlorine is in group seven, which is a minus one. So in order to get these two numbers to equal zero, I need two of these. So I write the symbol for calcium, it's my metal that comes first, the symbol for chlorine, and then I need a subscript of two to show that I need two chlorines every time I have one calcium. For magnesium bromide, right, magnesium is there in column two, um, which means it's a group two plus two um, atom. And here's bromine. Bromine is in the same group, actually, as chlorine, so it has a charge of minus one. So for every one magnesium, I need two bromines so that my charge equals zero. So I write that by writing the symbol for magnesium, Mg, the symbol for bromine, Br, and then a subscript of two. All right, now I'm going to show you something called the crisscross method. The crisscross method is kind of like a cheat for figuring out how many of each element I need when I write a chemical formula. So let's try our magnesium bromide again. Here's magnesium, right, it was plus two, bromine was minus one. Well, with the crisscross method, what I do is I take the number associated with the ion and I cross it over. So the two goes with the bromine and the one goes with the magnesium. So when I write it, I write Mg1, Br2. Now, I don't really need the one there because just having the magnesium there implies that I have one. So usually when there's a one, we don't write it. So I have Mg Br2. And that's what we got by using our addition to zero method. Let's take a look at a trickier one, aluminum oxide, or if we were English, aluminum oxide. So aluminum is on the periodic table here in group three. The symbol is Al, and it's a plus three. And oxi oxide is oxygen, right, with symbol O. It's here in group six, and its charge is minus two. So by our crisscross method, we take our three, and we put it with the O, and we take the two, and we put it with the Al. So when I write this, I get Al2O3. Now let's just check to make sure this works from a math standpoint. Right? Two times three, right, that would be plus six. And three times negative two, right, that would be minus six. And oh look, that adds up to zero. Woo! We're not sticky. Let's take a look at one with the polyatomic ion. Here I have barium nitrate. All right, barium is, symbol is Ba, and it's here in group two. So that makes it plus two. And nitrate, I can't find that on the periodic table. That's one of my polyatomic ions. But nitrate symbol is NO3, and its charge is minus one. So if I do the crisscross method, right, the one goes with the barium and the two goes with the nitrate. So I get Ba1, NO3, two. What? Wait, I have 32 oxygens in barium nitrate? That can't be right. 
Anytime we work with polyatomic ions, if there's more than one, like in this case I need two, I need to put parentheses in here. The parentheses make it one whole group that I have two of. So when I write barium nitrate, I write barium NO3 in parentheses and I put the two outside the parentheses. So that shows I have two nitrates, not 32 oxygens. All right, so let's do a couple more together. I have three here, sodium oxide, barium sulfate, and aluminum sulfide. Sodium is in group one, its symbol is Na, and it is a charge of plus one. Oxide is my oxygen, which is over here. Oxygen is a minus two. So in order to make this balance, I need two sodiums to one oxygen. So my formula would be Na2O crisscross or add to zero. How about barium sulfate? Barium sulfate, barium is Ba, the symbol is Ba, and it's in group two, so it's a plus two. Sulfate is one of our polyatomic ions, so I'm not gonna find it on the periodic table. That's one I have to have memorized. Sulfate is SO4, and it has a charge of minus two. Oh, plus two minus two adds to zero, not sticky. So I can just put them together, BASO4. How about aluminum sulfide? Sulfide's not a polyatomic ion. So aluminum, AL, right, it's here, so it's a plus three. Sulfide, on my periodic table, sulfur has a minus two. So we can crisscross or add to zero. And if I crisscross, I get two aluminum, so Al2S3. All right, I'm gonna give you some more and let's see how you do. All right, last couple. See if you can get these right. Pause the video. See if you can write the formulas for potassium bromide, aluminum phosphate, lithium nitrate, calcium sulfide, and magnesium chloride. How'd you do? Oh my gosh, this adventure has been exhausting. Are you exhausted too? See you in class.